So as always in this conference, you said, I met Jair, etc. Yes, I did met Jair the first time at a party. <laughs> and that was in Berkeley, in 82, when you were there. That's how we got to become very good friends. And ever since, the rest is history. I mean, we are, he's one of my closest friends, and the family are friends, you know, I mean, we know each other's kids, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> it's been, it's been uh, a lot of fun to talk to Jair always. He had always many, many ideas and so on. Incidentally, uh, uh, Juan Carlos just complained that I forgot to put geometry there because you see geometry, mechanics, and control. <laughs> so I apologize. So what do I, what do I want to show you? I want to, to leave you with, with two, two messages. In this, uh, in this talk. Um, the talk actually has two parts. They are interrelated, but not very strongly. Uh, the first one is that if you ignore symmetries, you do it at your own peril. And I will show you what I mean. Uh, this is one of the last papers that uh, the late Jerry Marsden wrote with me and with Francois Gebalma. And I'm going to show you what it means. I mean, I'm going to do first things that you know. I'm going to go quite, quite quickly because I'm going to start with the top, etc. But uh, by the time I, I uh, arrive at elasticity, it will be quite interesting. The second message is that there is an uncanny connection between control and, uh, and mechanics, which is very, very profound. And I don't really understand it. I will show you something, and they, uh, this has to do with what we call Klebsch optimal control. Uh, I apologize to the real control theorists like Val and Tony. These are fully actuated problems. In fact, Tony has taken over and has written later a paper with Peter Crouch and Nordquist where he has under-actuated systems. But my message is that there, there are uh, formulations of classical mechanical problems purely from the point of view of control theory, and, and they lead you to, to, to questions and to results that are rather unexpected, completely unexpected. Right? It was a big surprise for me. And uh, I have questions there. So this is what I want to do. So very briefly, I'm going to start because I, I want you to see my notation with Euler Poincare reduction. This has been already mentioned n times here. I will do the Euler top very, very quickly. Then I will show you a general theorem that uh, has implications in other things that I'm not even doing here. Uh, it has to do with semi-direct product and co-cycles, and uh, this is the theorem that is good for studying complex fluids, for example, liquid crystals. And this has led to results, including an analysis, by doing it this way. If I don't forget, I may, I may mention it. Then I will do the heavy top, just as an exercise, very quickly. Then I will show you something about fluids, and then I come to elasticity. That's sort of the first part. The second part, I'm going to, to begin with something completely weird, right? I mean, everything is fine. Now I'm going to show you other equations that lead to the free, to the Euler top. And you say, well, why would anybody in his right mind do it, right? And uh, we, in order to understand this, I will introduce a whole new class of optimal control problems. They're not really seriously controlled because I said, they're not, they're fully actuated. And then there are many examples. So I'm going to do one example after the other, and when my 60 minutes are over, I just stop. Right? I, I have tons, tons, tons and tons of examples. So the other Poincare reduction is the following. I give you a Lagrangian on a Lie group. This is Poincare 1901. I restrict the, f the function to the identity. I take a curve g of t in g. I take its derivative. Now I'm in the tangent space at the point g of t. I bring it back to the identity either left or right. Left for body, right for fluids usually. This is elasticity, this is fluids, and, I, and I'm going to show you later on why. And then Poincare states that four things are equivalent. The other Lagrange equations for L hold for any variation delta g of t that vanish at the end points. The variational principle of Hamilton holds for all variations with fixed endpoints, right? The euler poincare equations hold. This is where Poincaré has come in. And the euler poincare variational principle holds. 
However, this is a variational principle that is constrained. It is not a standard variational principle. Um, I will not prove it. I just want to make a simple comment. Obviously, one is equivalent to two. Three is equivalent to four once you believe this. And two is equivalent to four. It's almost automatic because all you do is you multiply by g minus one here. And it's not only that the variational principle is true, not only that the action is the same, is the integrand is the same. So uh, the, the content of the theorem is in here, is precisely in saying what is delta xi equal to eta dot plus or minus xi eta. And it's very simple. You have curves, you have a, a family of curves with fixed endpoints, right? And then you are going to take a derivative relative to the parameter that parameterizes the curves. Okay, you do this, and then you ask, if you bring them back to the identity exactly as I did here, either left or right, you have to decide what kind of a problem you have. Do you get all Lie algebra elements? The, an the answer is no. You get precisely this. And if this reminds you of connections, it should. Because, you know, for example, the, the Gauss formula and the Mellian geometry has things of that sort, right? It's truly there. And in fact, what underlies here is the maurer cartan form behind this. But for the moment, I'm not interested. The Legendre transformation is, uh, is the following. I have half the variables. Uh, so what happens here is the following. Assume that the map that sends a Lie algebra element xi to, a Lie, to the Lie algebra, to the uh, co-vector co mu, which is del L del xi, which is just a derivative of L uh, in G star, is if this is invertible, then you form the Hamiltonian exactly as you're think you should do it, right? PQ dot minus L, there it is, in this writing, even though you don't have Qs and Ps and Q dots, you have not, none of this. And then the euler poincare equations become the Lee Poisson equation. So if you are familiar with Lee Poisson, this is exactly the same thing. This is the Lagrangian counterpart of what we know from, from Lee Poisson equations and the the Lee Poisson bracket and the symplectic form on orbits, etc., etc. Now, why do you do this? You do this because of reduction, and the reason is the following: once you solve the Euler-Poincaré equations, or if you want the Lee Poisson equations, you have solved the problem completely. Why? Here is the algorithm. I'm taking my Lie algebra, my Lagrangian. I restrict it to the Lie algebra. That's an easy uh, thing to do. You solve the Euler-Poincaré equations. Here they are. Now, what do I mean by solving? Well, if it's integrable, then you just solve it, right? I mean, there are methods to do this. But what if it's not integrable, which is most of the case? Then you go numerically. We ha did not have numerical talks here. But, so I should at least tell you that we have, that there is a whole industry that is related to these equations and to these constrained variational principles. These are called variational integrators. They work fantastically well. A lot of um, discussion was here after various talks, uh, Dimitri's discretization of the Diffio group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, all I want to tell you is that uh, when I mean solve, I really mean it. Uh, we can do this numerically today quite well. Okay. Then you solve a linear equation with time-dependent coefficients. So if I would be a physicist, I would say I'm done. It's a time-ordered exponential. Of course, in mathematics, you cannot do this because you have to write something down, right? But we can do it. I mean, we know, after all, it's a linear equation. And now comes the formula, and the formula is finished. So I give you an initial condition, V at the point zero. This vector sits over a point, G0, and if you bring it to the identity, left or right, it's going to produce a Lie algebra element, xi0. Okay, so now I have given you the initial condition. Okay, what is the solution? Here it is. V of t is G0, G of t, xi of t. In other words, xi of t comes from here, with this initial condition, xi0, that comes from here. You solve this equation with E, then you just multiply here by G0, and you're done. That's the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations. So it's quite, quite remarkable. This is the miracle of reduction. I mean, we knew this ever since the 74 paper of Mars and Einstein, right? This is why they did it. Okay, so let's do the Euler top. I'm going to do it very, very, very fast. 
My group is SO3. The Lie algebra is little SO3, skew symmetric matrices. There is an isomorphism with R3 with a cross product. The isomorphism is given by the map. Take the vector product. The kinetic energy is one half m v square, but I mean rotation. There is an I here. Omega is the uh, angular velocity in the body. And I'm going to write it this way. For the moment, this is not that important, but I will come back to this writing later. The point is that uh, this, there is another matrix lambda, and it's given in this fashion, or if you wish, I1 equal to lambda 2 plus lambda 3 plus circular permutations. And uh, this relationship, this kinetic energy, can be expressed in this fashion in terms of matrices. Okay, here I is a diagonal matrix because I have diagonalized the moment of inertia tensor. Uh, the axes are called uh, uh, the, pr the principal axis body frame. Uh, these are the principal moments of inertia. This is an expression in the body. I'm sitting on the body and I'm expressing the energy as I sit on the body. Okay. And then the Euler-Poincaré or Lipposon equations for K are simply pi dot equal to pi cross omega, which are the classical Euler equations in 1750-something, 57, I think. Okay, now on SO3, I have a left invariant metric. What is the geometric interpretation of this? Whose value at the identity is given in this fashion. Rho zero is the density of the body, the mass distribution. You integrate this, and therefore you get an inner product. Uh, the inner product is related to the dot product, you compute this i, and indeed, this, this is the moment of inertia tensor. You, 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 you just look at the expressions. It's, com it's completely elementary. So how do you solve these equations? Well, you solve pi dot equal to pi cross omega, where pi is i omega, so this is a quadratic equation, right? This is done with Jacobi elliptic functions. You solve a dot equal to a omega hat. A of zero is, uh, with a of zero i. This is linear equation with time-dependent coefficients. Therefore, the solutions are t goes into a0, a t. These are the geodesics in ISO3 with initial condition a0 and omega0 is 0. So what are the geodesic equations? The geodesic equations are the pair of equations, pi dot equal to pi cross omega, a dot equal to a omega hat. If you take the tangent bundle of your manifold, which is SO3, and you trivialize it, here I use left trivialization, into SO3 cross R3. Right? This, uh, this is the global way to write this. No coordinates, nothing. Please notice, again, the miracle of reduction because of invariance of the kinetic energy. Notice that the first equation does not depend on A. Right? It's a triangular process. This is purely in terms of omega or pi, depending on how you look at it. And this, is and this once you have the solution here, then you can solve for A. Right? Exactly as before. Now, okay, so far so good. But I want to look at the body, right? I want to look at it. I don't want to write the equation sitting on the body. I want to write the equations as I look on the, at the body. So what is the spatial representation? So the spatial angular velocity is, uh, is given by in the following way. Omega hat is a, a dot a minus 1. And pi is a pi is the spatial angular momentum. But now there is a new variable that appears. It's the moment of inertia in spatial representation. This guy now is time dependent. This one wasn't, the, this I. Remember? I'm on the body. So, so I cannot do it using the euler poincare equations. Certainly not the way they are. So I have to do something else. So I'm going to jump various uh, steps. I'm going to give you a very large, it's not the most general one, but it's, 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 it's a pretty large one. So I want to tell you something about affine Euler-Poincaré reduction. So here I have my Lie group G. I have a representation space V. I'm going to act on the right, because in fluids I use right. So let's do some gymnastics. I told you left here. Now I'm going to do it on the right to see, for you to see the various minus signs that are sprinkled all over the place. And now you have various representations of V star, infinitesimal on V, and infinitesimal on V star. Right? The usual ones. So here, here is my writing. So my writing is G acts on V, G acts on A, G acts on Xi acts on V, etc. That's the infinitesimal generator of the action, for example. There are duality pairings between G star and G and between V star and V. So here is the formula. Uh, I put this formula here because there is a minus that you have to put. 
when you do this. Now, in addition to that, I want to add something to the contra gradient representation, this one. So instead of having just a G, I'm going to add a C of G here. Now you want this to be an action, and you want it to be a right action. So there must be an identity that is being satisfied. So you write the identity that's being satisfied, and this imposes something on C of G. And what is imposed on C of G is this relation. C of FG is CF times G plus C of G. Now, if you look in any algebra book, this turns out to be a group one cocycle. So there is a lot of other material coming in here, which I will not go into more than necessary. So this is truly a group one cocycle. And uh, if I want to compute the infinitesimal generator, I'm going to write it in this way. This is the contra gradient infinitesimal representation. And here I denote it simply T dc of xi. Well, what is this? I take the derivative at the identity of C in the direction xi, and I'm just going to call it d xi, the, the, the derivative, the differential of xi, of, 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 of the co-cycle. Now, what, is, what we have to introduce in order to compute, I need certain transposes or duals. Here they are. And I need this operation. Now, here we are in a community that knows momentum maps. This is nothing else but the momentum map of the lift deduction from V to V star. But if you don't know this, don't, I, it doesn't matter. Here it is. Here is, the, here is the formula. I give you a V, I give you an A, and I feed it XI. I get a number, and this is the number. It's the momentum map. OK, now that I have a group and a vector space, I form the semi-direct product. There are 16 ways to define semi-direct products, so you have to be very careful when you read somebody's work. So here, here are my conventions, G1, V1, G2, V2. G1, G2, and here V2 plus G2 acting on V1. The Lie algebra is a semi-direct product Lie algebra. The bracket is given, of course, in the first term. is just Xi1, Xi2. In the second one is Xi2 on V1 minus Xi1 on V2. We know already from before that the coadjoint action is the one that is very important. So here is the coadjoint action computed. So the, the add star of xi v on mu a, mu is in g star and a is in v star, has this formula. Now in physical uh, problems, for example, liquid crystals or complex fluids, superfluids, whatever, you are given the following physical situation. I give you a Lagrangian that depends on some parameters v star. Okay? Uh, you'll see them in the heavy top in a second. Even in elementary problems you have this. Uh, and this is right invariant under an action. Now, now I wrote this action here, and you say, what kind of a nightmare is this? Right? It's not a nightmare. It's what is left over from the semi-direct product action on its cotangent bundle. And I'm claiming in the process that this is invariant under, that this is an invariant submanifold for that action. Okay, so there it is. I wrote it down. I fix an A0, and I, I, I fix and I call the Lagrangian with that A0 fixed, L index A0. Here it is. Then this one is invariant under the lift to, T, to TG of the right translation of the isotropy group with the co-cycle C at the point A0. So, for example, if C, if you have no, well, let, let's make it simple. Even if A0 is 0, this object here may not be the whole group because of the co-cycle. Of course, if the, there is no co-cycle, then G0 is G. Okay. Now, I have a right invariance of L. This right invariance here permits us to define a map from G cross V star into V. Please notice that now this map is defined on pairs. Right? The LA0 was not. It was only on TG has nothing to do with V star. V star were just parameters that went, went along for the ride. Not anymore. Goes from G cross V star into R, and it's given in this fashion. I'm going to refer to this formula later on. It's, the formula is not as important as the fact that you know that it is there. Right? There is a map that tells you how to go from TG cross V star into German G cross V star. And it's given in this fashion. OK, so it's concrete. We can compute it. Now I do exactly as Poincaré before, right? I take a curve G of T. I take the derivative. I do it on the right. OK, here it is. And now I, do, I take the same G of T, and I form an A of T here. 
another a curve in V star. Then this AT is the unique solution of the following affine differential equation with time dependent coefficients and initial condition. Here it is. You obtain it by simply taking the derivative of this and you get this. This is the unique solution of this and the other way around, right? Okay. So this is what usually we, we would call in continuum mechanics, if this term wasn't here, advection. If you have co-cycles, it's another story. It's not really advection anymore. And this does appear in complex fluids. Okay, so now the following are equivalent. It's basically the same theorem. With A0 fixed, Hamilton's variational principle holds for variations delta G of T of GT vanishing at the endpoints. G of T satisfies Euler-Lagrange for every fixed A0 in V star on G. The constraint variational principle delta L of Xi of T A of T DT is equal to zero holds upon using variations of the form const the same constraint that you have seen before only algebra elements and with the same eta that appears here and these the variations of the parameters are also constrained. Here they are. This, this eta is exactly the same as the other eta. And the only condition on eta is it vanishes at the endpoints. It's not delta C and delta A who vanish at the endpoints. It's eta who vanishes at the endpoints. Okay. And the Fn, uh, Fn Euler Poincare equations hold on G cross V star. Here they are. This piece you have seen before. If you add this piece here, this has to do with semi direct products and no co cycle. If you add this term, then you also have the co cycles. So, I'm having a system of equations. What is that system of equations? Here is one equation, and here is the other one. This is what you need to solve. Okay, so let's go ahead. I had trouble with the Euler top, so let's do it. I want to write the equations of motion in spatial representation. In other words, I want to use a dot a minus 1 omega hat here. So I need to implement reduction relative to right translation by SO3. Now, if, if I have such a symmetry, I have to introduce this new variable, as, as you saw before, IS equal to AIA minus 1. In this case, the associated reduction process, I told you exactly how it is, is obtained in the following way. Now, the spatial Lagrangian, the kinetic energy in this case, depends on two variables, on omega and on the spatial angular momentum, and it's, of course, one half mv squared in rotation, right, I omega squared, and I wrote it here, in this fashion. Again, I will come back to this. The Euler-Poincaré uh, variational principle gives you variations of this type. Here they are. I wrote them in general. There is a phi and there is a, and this phi here also appears here, right? And this is the variational principle. Recall that little pi i s omega is the spatial angular momentum. And what are the equations of motion? D dt of pi is equal to zero, and d dt of is is omega hat times uh, bracket with is. So we, we recover here a very well-known result in rigid body dynamics. The spatial angular momentum is conserved, right? This leads to all sorts of interesting things, right? Because I'm on T star of SO3. I want to have an integrable system. Yes, it is integrable. How many integrals do I need? Three. How many do I have? Energy plus three. I have four. Big problem, right? But they don't commute. So this is what is called the super integrable system or the non-abelian integrable system. Is this important? Yes, it is. Because that means that the Liouville Arnold tori are not three tori. Sure, they are three tori. But who cares? They are two tori. In other words, if you want to do adiabatic theory, whatever, where you assume generic conditions, you are sunk from the beginning. You have... You have uh, resonances everywhere. This happens also in the Kepler problem because of the Runge lens vector. Now let's compute a little bit how many equations we have. I have 3 plus 6 equal to 9 equations. So it's not very convenient. Sure, because the energy was naturally left invariant. So I'm paying a price in doing this. Let's do the heavy top. I'm going to do it equally fast here. The potential energy U is determined by the height of the center of mass. So I have a fixed... I have a body with a fixed point in the center of mass here, and I have various uh, uh, parameters, the length of the segment from the fixed point to the center of mass. Chi is the unit vector from the origin to the segment. I have the total mass of the body. Here it is. These are no, this is a number, this is a number, this is a vector. 
right? G is magnitude of the gravitational acceleration, another number. And now I have two new vectors. Gamma of t is MGL, this is a number. 80 minus 1 is 3, so the attitude matrix times is 3. Is 3 is the spatial vertical axis pointing in the opposite direction than the direction of gravity. And I have lambda t MGL 80 chi, which is the unit vector on the line connected with the origin with the center of mass viewed in the spatial description. Right? I'm looking at it, and this vector moves as the body moves. Right? So I have my potential energy in material or Lagrangian representation. Here it is. In spatial or Lerian representation, or in body or convective representation. Right? When we do uh, continuum mechanics, you have the holy trinity. You have to have material, spatial, and body. You always have to think this way. Okay, new complications appear. Now we have more variables that came out of nowhere, right? So what are they? Lambda and the gamma. Okay, so let's ask a question. So what, what do you do now? So I'm taking my Lagrangian kinetic minus potential. The parameters are E3, chi, I, symmetric 2 by 2 tensor, moment of inertia, and the number MGL. So the dual representation space is R3, R3, symmetric matrices. Now, there is no, there is democracy between particles. We have no co-cycles. I'm not going to do anything with co-cycles here in this talk. So C is equal to zero. So I want to write the Lagrangian in material representation. I have it. And here is the, here is the formula. This you have seen before, and this you have seen the page above. Now, I have to do it in body. I did it material. I have to do it in body and in space. So let's do it in body. The left SO3 representation is given in the following way. Uh, so what moves? I'm on the left. Well, that means I'm on the body. So for me, I and Kai are frozen. I don't see anything. They don't move. So the, so the only, uh, sorry, the only action is on E3. This is it, B3. Here it is. Now I have this invariance property. So now I'm on a freeway. I just applied the theorem. So the general theory says that we have Euler-Poincaré equations and associated variational principle for the body Lagrangian. Remember I told you there was a formula that related little l with capital L. That's all I'm doing here. I literally implement it in this case. So the l in the body depends on omega, gamma, i, and chi, and it's given by this formula. And, you know, if you do this, well, lo and behold, of course, it works only in body variables. Good. You compute the derivatives, which is a child's play. So the abstract Euler-Poincaré equations become the standard Euler-Poisson equations. Pi dot equal to pi omega plus gamma cross chi. Gamma dot equal to gamma cross omega. And of course, i and chi don't move. So of course, you, nobody is ever going to write this down. And you see these six equations in any book. OK, now let's do it on the space. I have. SO3 representation, and here now I'm in the space. So E3 doesn't move, but I and chi do move, and I have to be on the right. So it's B minus 1 IB and B minus 1 chi. Okay. Now I check invariance. Yes, it works. And I apply the general theory. So the general theory tells me, by that formula that I emphasized before, that the spatial Lagrangian that depends on omega, E3, IS, and lambda, is related to the material Lagrangian in a certain way, with a certain map. Well, here is the map explicitly written in this case. And of course, what you get is here it should be not spatial S. I changed notation. I don't know why. One half omega I spatial omega minus E3 lambda. I compute the derivatives, and I get the Euler equations. Right? What are they? Pi dot equal to E3 lambda. E3 is 0, of course. I dot S equal to I S omega hat. And lambda dot equal to omega cross lambda. How many equations do I have? Lots. Three, six, three, 12. Okay, what's going on? In the body representation, we have seen that the semi-direct product that was given by the Euler-Poincaré equation was SE3, which is, of course, isomorphic to R3 cross R3. Now, the Casimir functions are pi dot gamma and gamma squared. So we are on four-dimensional generic orbits. These four-dimensional generic orbits are cotangent bundles, which are magnetic. 
That's the, that's the general situation. Okay, what's happening in spatial representation? Well, I know I'm on a semi-direct product because the theorem told me what it is. It's going to be SO3 cross symmetric 2 by 2 tensor R3. This is 12 dimensional. It has six Casimirs. Here they are, the invariants of IS, three, four, five, six. Six Casimirs. Right, there has to be, I mean, mathematics is at least an honest science. You can't, there is no free lunch anywhere and it's not getting more complicated than it should be. So if here I'm in four, I can't be here in six. It's just immoral, right? So uh, indeed, you can fix matters. There is one more integral that I didn't count here, which is not a Casimir, is the third component of pi. You do symplectic reduction, you are back to, to the tangent bundle of the sphere, cotangent bundle, with magnetic term. So no free lunch. It's all the time that does the same thing. There is a Hamiltonian version of all the semi-direct product with co-cycles, etc., to which I will not go. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, let's do fluids. So the body and the space are just a domain. Call it D. And this domain is nothing else but an oriented Riemannian manifold with smooth boundary. And I have metrics. I'm going to have a metric here, which I call capital G, and I have a metric here, which I call little g. But this is all the same. So this is some Riemannian metric, which I just call little g. My group is the diffeomorphism group. And the Lie algebra is uh, vector fields. And I have parameters. Symmetric two tensors, contravariant, its dual is covariant symmetric two tensors, densities. That's my notation for density. Okay. So, according to the principle that when you do continuum mechanics, you have to see it in three ways. Material, spatial, body. So, what is the material? It's, of course, one half mv square. Here is the metric. I compute it. This is, uh, this is the material velocity. Now, the material velocity is not a vector field. It is a vector field covering the diffeomorphism eta. This is not a vector field. Only if eta is the identity, is it a vector field. Okay? Minus some internal energy. And the internal energy depends on the total mass of the body. When I have bars, I mean densities, and without bars I mean a function, I'll, I'll show you in a second. It depends on the inner product, on the metric, and on the derivative of the configuration. This has a name in continuum mechanics, it's called the deformation gradient. It has nothing to do with gradient, but they write gradient, even in the engineering literature. It's just the tangent map of the, of the deformation. Okay, in the spatial representation here, you recognize it immediately, it's one half g, V, V, this is the Eulerian or spatial velocity. This is a vector field minus E of rho times the density rho bar. Okay? The rho viewed as a density if you have a density or if you have a volume form. And in the convective, it's going to depend on the convective velocity, rho bar, and another metric C. I'm going to explain this in a second. But look, it's the same type of thing that happens here. There is a metric. It's one half mv square, as usual, minus some internal energy density, right, which is rho bar, depends on rho bar and on c. Now, what is the notation? So, rho bar is a density. Uh, I have a Riemannian metric, so it has an associated Riemannian volume. This is mu. So, rho bar is rho mu. Rho is a function. Rho bar is a density. And the relationship between him and the spatial density is simply given by pullback as densities. Uh, and the usual row that you see in fluid dynamics is a function, and it is just a coefficient of mu of g of rho bar viewed as a density. Okay. Who is C? C is the pullback of the metric g. This has a name. It's called the Cauchy-Green tensor in, in, uh, in continuum mechanics. And here I have given you all the relationship between the, all the possible energies, the internal energy densities, how they depend on each other. Okay. This is less important at this point. The message is there are precise relations. I can write them down. The only thing I want to draw your attention to is that here I have E of rho times rho bar. This is a 
a function, in general an arbitrary function, of the density rho, viewed as a function, right? Completely nonlinear. Remember this. This is the only message here. Okay, now, what can I, what can I do? Well, it is right invariant under this action. I wrote it down for you. And the reduction map, according to the general theorem, is given in this fashion. And it's true that it's okay, because all you have to do is verify that the internal energy behaves correctly. And it does. The metric, of course, is uh, invariant under the full group. Okay. Now, but it's also left invariant under the action of another, another type of action of the diffeomorphism group, and it's this one. And there is, with this goes a reduction map. Of course, I write it down. It's that abstract formula that I pointed out to you in the theorem, here it is. And it in induces a convective Lagrangian or a body Lagrangian, which is given in this fashion because the internal energy satisfies the correct invariance property. So if I do fluids, what are these things? Material representation means I am a particle and I want to write the equations of motion as I view it me being a particle, right? Spatial representation means I'm sitting here, I look at the river, the river passes by, I want to write the equations. That's spatial. And body, I am a fish. And I have a tripod stuck in me, a frame, and I'm swimming in the water, right? And I want to see the equations of motion from this point of view. That's convective. Okay. So, apply the theory. I mean, we're on a freeway. We don't have to think. It's not here. It's here, right? You have to compute. So, you compute, and you get, lo and behold, in the spatial representation, exactly the Euler equations. Even the correct thing, P is equal to rho squared, D, D rho comes out. Everything comes out. Okay. What are the convective equations? Look here what's happening. The, this is, of course, this is a material derivative. Right? It happens here also. Uh, this row here, I, I like to write it this time here. But this is constant. I mean, it, it's constant. It's a, it's a constant function. Right? It's not a number. But it does, it, it's time independent. So I have something that looks a little bit different. But here it's very interesting. Who is being advected? The metric. It's not relativity. I'm sure you have never seen this equation now. It's fundamental fluid dynamics. Okay, and the right-hand side, this divergent relative to the metric of this is given in, I, I wrote it down in, in its full glory, in any way you want. Let's do an example. Important special case, ideal homogeneous incompressible fluid. That's not physics, right? That's geometry. That, that's geodesics. So I take the, uh, the volume-preserving diffeomorphism group, here it is, uh, okay, uh, I look at the Lagrangian in spatial and the, and the convective representation. I'm going to simplify matters by assuming that the first cohomology is zero. You don't need to, but it's easier to explain. And this goes all the way back to a 1983 paper of uh, Jerry and Alan. Well, here is the spatial total energy, just kinetic. And of course, this is the kinetic energy. There's no potential. This is it. Now, in spatial represent, in, 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 in finite dimensions, the duals are always the same. I mean, uh, Rn dual is Rn. There is nothing we can do. However, in uh, infinite dimensions, the dual is in the eye of the beholder, right? You choose your dual. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. So one choice is formally. It's completely formal. I mean, analysis here is, uh, you know, I'm shoving under the rug lots of things that are not quite okay but analytically, but forget that for the moment. Uh, I, take that, I take this, this divergence free vector field tangent to the boundary, parallel to the boundary if you want. And if I do this, I get, the Euler, I get the Euler equations. But of course, as a geometer, you never think of duals of vector fields as, as, as vector fields, right? What is the natural thing? Forms. But the vector fields are divergence free. 
So there cannot be all the forms. Well, you do your little work using the harsh decomposition, and you come to the conclusion that there are exact two forms. In fact, they are D of V flat. So you take V, you drop the index by the matrix G, take the D. This is called vorticity in fluid dynamics. And what are the equations of motion? Dt omega is plus LV omega equal to zero, where omega is DV flat. In other words, this equation and this equation are equivalent, right? If there's a blue dual and a green dual, right? If you find the gray dual, go ahead, right? You'll find other equivalent equations. There is nothing to prove. This is a big theorem in fluid dynamics. So, now what do I do in convective representation? Of course, I can do the same thing. I can do it. In, with forms or, in, or, or, or vector fields, etc. So the first one is not very interesting. There is a Hodge projector here plus a co uh, advection of the metric. However, if I do it with exact two forms, it gets awfully interesting. dt omega is equal to zero and dtc minus lvc equal to zero. So the advected vorticity is conserved. Remember the rigid body. The spatial momentum was conserved. Here, the advected vorticity is conserved. Same phenomenon, same thing. Okay, let's do elasticity very, very quickly. Here, I just want to tell you a few things. So, the problem is that either Poincaré theory really doesn't apply. I mean, we are not on a group anymore here. Because uh, here is a body, and I embed it here and I twist it. I mean, these are embeddings, they are not diffeomorphisms. But it doesn't matter. You can start working in the Lagrange, like Lagrange, Poincaré, etc., but you don't need to. You can do it simply by the seat of your pants, working line by line as if you would do the proof of the Euler Poincaré equation. So that's exactly what you do. And now, elasticity is more complicated. There are boundary conditions that are important. There are displacement boundary conditions, which means that eta is given on a part of the boundary. There are traction boundary conditions. And if you know what it is, it's fine. If not, it doesn't matter. This is the piola Kirchhoff tensor, for example. I mean, there, okay, there are boundary conditions. Okay, the configuration space is embeddings, if it's smooth. And the material Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. Let's stop right here. It's a function that depends on the metric. We have seen this before. It depends on the deformation gradient. We have seen this before. Well, now body and space are divorced. So it depends also on the other inner product, and the inner product on B is G, and the inner product on S, the metric, is little g. But it doesn't depend on rho. See? This object is linear in rho. What does this mean? It means that fluids are not special cases of solids. See what I mean? I always assumed, till very recently, my God, I mean, fluid, I mean, this is a special case. You're going to see no. And here you see it explicitly. Now, of course, you can build materials that are, and we wrote it in our paper, but I don't know how realistic those are. But the classical elasticity does not have it. It's a linear in row. And in fluids, it was not. Okay. Now, in... There's a fundamental principle of material frame indifference. The material stored energy function, W, is invariant under, the, under these transformations. What does this mean? Well, uh, this is, of course, th this, this, of course, works. It always does, the kinetic energy. But the potential doesn't. But you see this, and, ah, yes, 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 you will see this in the books, that this is required of W. That's what W needs to satisfy to have a physical theory of elasticity. Okay. And that is called material frame indifference. And there it is. So therefore, I can define a convective stored energy, W, by the formulas that we have seen before. All the time, I'm using the same thing over and over again. So here it is. It depends on C and on G. I tell you how it is. This is the identity map. Well, it's there. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Therefore... There are convective quantities, and I don't know already who they are. It's the Cauchy-Green tensor. Here they are exactly like in fluids. I have written them in gory detail down. I write the convective Lagrangian down. And here are the convective equations of motion. Right? This is what you see in books. 
if you talk to, a, to an elasticity person, he always works in convective representation. Always. Never in spatial. I never understood this till I wrote this paper. Now comes the punchline. So elasticity is always convective representation. Well, I should do it in space, right? After all, I should be able to write such equations down. Well, what does this mean? Well, I need invariance under the right action of div b. I know what I need to apply the theorem. Right? So I need this. Well, kinetic energy is doing it. No problem. This, then I look at the potential. And I require that the potential satisfies this. Unfortunately, it doesn't. In fact, it's even better than this. Potentials that do are called materially covariant. And the fundamental theorem tells me material covariance is equivalent to the isotropy of the material. In other words, only isotropic materials have spatial representations. You want to do general materials, you cannot have spatial representation. See what I mean? You ignore... Uh, symmetry at your own peril. That's exactly one of the punchlines. I certainly didn't know this till I did it. I wish that somebody would have told me this, but nobody did. Even for Jerry it was a surprise. Anyway, if you do this, I don't want to go into this because I want to show you other interesting things. So, so you can do it. It's more complicated. Now I'm going to, to go back. I'm going to use only the, the simplest Euler-Poincaré equation, right? And I'm going to show you something completely insane. Okay? Well, I'm, what is the n-dimensional free rigid body? That's easy. You take this as the pairing, identifies SOM with SOM star. We know what the equations of motion are, exactly as before, except that I denote the matrix is now Q. And I denote my pi by M, because that is traditionally how it was done. Okay? <clears throat> so these are the geodesic equation of the left invariant metric whose value at the identity is this. Fine. And here I need uh, my moment of inertia operator, and here I literally need lambda omega plus omega lambda. Not, I cannot deal with any left invariant metric, only with so-called rigid body metrics. Here they are, lambda omega plus omega lambda. Okay. So we know what this is. This is not a problem. These equations are the Euler-Poincaré equation or SON for the Lagrangian given by the kinetic energy. This corresponds to the material Lagrangian on TSON given in this fashion. Of course, I didn't do anything special. The general Euler-Poincaré theory implies that this m dot equal to m omega are, uh, is the second component of the geodesic equations on TSON. Left trivialized as SON cross SON relative to the metric given by the uh, moment of inertia of the body. Now, uh, these are integrable. Manakov started this. He showed how to do it. Here it is. You, you write this equation equivalent to this. Notice that there is something here that is not obvious. This clearly the DDT of this, because lambda is just a formal parameter, and lambda square is a constant. This is DDT m. The right-hand side, you get m omega, and you get other junk. The other junk with lambda square is clearly zero, because it's lambda square lambda, but there is a lambda term that has to vanish, and it does precisely because m is omega lambda plus lambda omega, precisely, the, precisely because of that. Now, therefore, the traces of these are conserved, therefore the coefficients are conserved, and Manakov in 76 counted all of this, and uh, he noticed that this is exactly half the dimension of the generic orbit, and he said, I have no idea how to prove involution and independence. This has been done by Mishchenko Fomenko in a series of papers between 76 and 78, and it goes far beyond anything. It's like a total lattice. It's associated to any Dinkin diagram. So for any Dinkin diagram, you have a rigid body, and it's even better than that. There is a complex. There is a split normal, which is easy. There is a compact normal form, and the intersection of the split normal with a compact. SLNC, SLNR, SUN, SON. This is a tremendous amount of work, and, uh, you know, it's known, but I actually think that this is one of the greatest results in integrable systems, and I don't think they get enough credit for this. Okay. So far, so good. Now I'm going to show you something completely off the wall. 
I write q dot equal to q omega, p dot equal to p omega. Omega is regarded as a function of q and p via the relation. Omega is j minus 1m. We know what that is, right? And m is qtp minus ptq. Okay. So now you have equations in, on son cross son, right? These are both in son. And this is invariant under the left diagonal action. If qp is a solution of this equation, symmetric rigid body in dimension m, then qm, where m is j omega, and q is omega is q inverse q dot from here, satisfies the rigid body equations in n dimension. Why would anybody in his right mind do this? I have a perfectly nice theory, right? And now I'm going to tell you uh, some results of an old paper that we have written with Tony Block and Jerry, and then are, I'm going to tell you what's happening. So a lot, the proof is nothing, it's literally that much. Take the derivative and see. And regardless of what you may think, I lost all the structure, I'm sorry, you can't argue with the computation. The computation works, it's right. So, it, but it gets much better. The spatial angular momentum, in other words, the momentum map for the cotangent lifted action of SON on T star SON, right, equals PQT minus QPT. See, look, it's uh, just a bit uh, different, right? It's also conserved. More, each one of them is conserved. Okay? There is a local equivalence. Again, I don't want to go through this. We can solve the equation in a certain domain where the norm of m is smaller than 2, etc., etc., I, I, because I, I look at the time. There is a Poisson bracket, which is, uh, anyway, everything is working. But it's working because it's working. It's not working because I understand why it's working. Okay. So let me show you how to handle this. So at this point, I'm just going to apply things blindly without any explanation. I'm taking a time t, and I'm taking two points, q0 and qt in SOM. I'm going to call the rigid body optimal control problem the following. Minimize over SOM this cost functional. J is the u lambda plus lambda u. And I have a constraint. There is a curve q of t in SON such that q dot equal to qu. I start at zero, end up in t. Proposition. The rigid body optimal control problem has optimal evolution equation given by precisely this one, this insanity here. Where p is the co-state vector given by the Pontryagin maximum principle. And the optimal control in this case is given in this fashion. How do you do it? Well, apply Pontryagin maximum principle to this. Now, this is fast said. Let me go slower. There are no constraints. And there, are, there are all sorts of other things. I mean, I can argue about these QTs and so on. So the, the meaning is you can discretize, you can have an algorithm, you can do all sorts of things, right? Uh, in fact, Tony has done this in, in, in his paper also. Okay. So what is an optimal control problem? Uh, let me give it, uh, let, let me tell you. Q is a manifold, U is a vector space. I give you a cost function, G, Q cross U in R. I give you a family of vector fields that depend parametrically on U. That's what I mean here. And for every U frozen, I have a vector field on X. I give you a Q0 and QT in Q. I consider the typical optimal control problem. Find the curve Q of T in Q and U of T in U that minimize this. Subject to the following condition, I give you a dynamics, x, q of t is, q of t is equal to the dot, is x of q of t and u of t, and it starts at q0 and ends up at qt, right? I mean, to, to lighten the atmosphere, I have a bomber, right? <laughs> I have to use as little gas as possible. I have to get from here and bomb here, right? <laughs> That's why the Air Force pays for this. <laughs> so... In this, in this field, there is the Pontryagin maximum principle. I'm going to give you a bastardized version of it in which I ignore all the analysis, right? I'm perfectly aware that one has to be much more precise like in fluids. But here it is. I form the function h hat, t star q cross u with real values. I just force, form it. How do I form it? 
exactly as if this G would have been a Lagrangian. P, Q dot minus L. Of course, it isn't. But what's uh, Q dot between friends, right? Forget it. Right? There it is. And P0 is a fixed positive constant. The Pontryagin maximum principle says that if Q of T and U of T is a solution of this optimal control problem, then there is an alpha of T that covers Q of T, a curve Q of T, in the cotangent bundle, such that this alpha T satisfies Hamilton's equation for the Hamiltonian, which I denote H hat of UT. How do you compute this Hamiltonian in this fashion? H hat alpha T U of T is the maximum over U, of h hat alpha t u, you let you compute the maximum of all the u, that's why it's the maximum principle, and this here is the Hamiltonian vector field with every u frozen. That's what Pontryagin is telling you. Okay, if p0 is different from 0, you can replace alpha t by this over p0. It shows that h0, uh, you can always assume that p0 is 1. Solutions with p0 are called normal extremals. Solutions with p0 is 0 are called abnormal extremals. I simplify my life. I work only with normal extremals and set P0 equal to 1 from now on. Okay, so for example, if H, is equal to, if H happens to be C1, then the optimal control U of T is found by solving this equation, a sufficient condition, there are theorems, that guarantees that the maximum is achieved along the control U of T is that X is linear and U and G are strictly convex in U. In this case, the optimal control is uniquely determined. So locally, how do you do it? I mean, in an ideal world, if you could do all of this and everything would be smooth and nice, etc., which is not the case. The Pontryagin maximum principle states that alpha of t, which is q of t, p of t, and u of t are determined by these three equations. dh hat du equal to 0, q dot equal to dh hat dp, which happens to be uh, x of q u, and p dot equal to minus dh hat dq. So if this one you can solve for u equal to u of alpha, then these equations are simply the Hamilton's equation. If you, re if you write h of alpha, h hat of alpha, and you replace your p by u of alpha. There, there you are. If you could do this. This happens locally, for example. Again, convex theory. If h hat is of class C2 and the uh, Hessian uh, computed uh, the second derivative, it's not Hessian, uh, computed at a given point is an isomorphism. Then if x is linear in u and g is strictly convex, this holds at every point. And there is a variational principle that goes with it. Hamilton's variational principle. So that's very nice. Now let me show you what kind of uh, control problems I'm going to introduce. I take an action, g cross q in q, the action of a Lie group g on a manifold q. Here is my infinitesimal generator. I call it u index q. Here it is. The Klebsch optimal control problem is given in the following fashion. I give you an L from g into r. I need to find u of t, q of t, such that this is minimal, subject to the following condition. Well, I don't have dynamics. So what is the dynamics? The dynamics is going to be given by the action. There is nothing else around. So I, for every t, I compute u of t, which is a Lie algebra element. I take its infinitesimal generator, and I evaluate it for the same t on the curve q of t. So both this t and that t is, are needed. This is the same t, here and here. And this is the inverse representation. This is also important sometimes. And I have initial and end condition. OK. So this is exactly as before, except it's a very simple situation. The situation is u, the vector space is g, and g of q u is L of u. It doesn't even depend on q. OK? And x of q u is just the infinitesimal generator. And it's already linear in u. We have seen this is important. Okay, so what's the Pontryagin function, right? The Pontryagin function, I write it. Depends if it's uh, direct or inverse, this plus minus mean nothing. Here it is, pq dot minus L of u, there it is. Wow, the momentum map, out of nowhere. I was not doing symplectic geometry. There it is. You're going to see more of this. Okay, here is a theorem. Assume that the Legendre transform, so to speak, is a diffeomorphism. Let Gx on the left, then an extremal solution of the Klebsch optimal control problem with the first condition is a solution of del L del U is J of alpha, which I know that I can solve. 
right? Because it's a diffio. Alpha dot is the infinitesimal generator of the lifted action. I can do much, much better than this. The solution is alpha of t is the action on alpha on the right. I worked on the left. The solution is given on the right. This is not a typo. Okay? Where g dot g minus 1 is u of t. And these equations imply the euler poincare equations for the control u. Here they are. Let me read it again backwards. I have solved the problem. How do I have, how I have, how did I solve it? I need u of t and alpha of t. Well, I'm going to give them to you. I solved the euler poincare equations. Here they are. Now I have a u of t. If I have a u of t, I have a g of t. Okay? But if I have a g of t, I have an alpha of t. Finished. I'm done. The theorem guarantees then that this holds and that these are Hamilton's equations. It's quite astounding, isn't it? I mean, I started with a control problem and I literally fall on my face on the other Poincaré equations. Right? I didn't search them. I was not doing symplectic geometry. I was not doing Lagrangian mechanics. Uh, the proof is very simple. I'm not going to, I would have shown it to you, but it's literally that much. All the details are in one page. I'll leave it here. Forget this. Let me show you, let me end up with this one because this, this, this I, I, I just can't stop. Let's take the simplest case. L of u is one half u square, where the norm is associated to any inner product on G in finite dimensions. Okay? Now we know that the Pontryagin Hamiltonian is very important. Right? So let's compute it. Norm square of the momentum map. I mean, anybody who's a symplectic geometer jumps up. I mean, this is the function that is used to prove the convexity theorems. This, from this point of view, is Mickey Mouse. It's nothing. It's the simplest example you can think of. What, what is the message of all of this? I have no idea. What does this have to do with the convexity property of the momentum map? Granted, I'm on cotangent bundles. I can't apply Atiyah, Gilliman, Sturm, and Kerwan. But there, there is a result of Siamar for cotangent bundles. So there is a convexity theory for cotangent bundles with compact base. Right? Is the convexity theorem of an instant of a much more general theory in, in control theory? I have no idea. If you follow this through, you get the normal metric, and everything I have told you about the SON becomes as a very, very special example from this point of view. And let me stop here. Thank you very much. Do you have questions for Tudor? <laughs>